Welcome back to Senate Education, 3.38 p.m. on Wednesday, April 21st. And we are returning to H106, uh, work that we started on, uh, have already done some work on. <clears throat> this is an act relating to equitable access to high quality education through community schools. And uh, one way of thinking about this bill is it, it well, we know it's a pilot. Uh, we know that it um, would fund uh, positions, a position in schools that qualified or were approved uh, through an application process, and that these um, individuals uh, would work on wrap, developing wraparound services, uh, making certain that students uh, have what they need um, as it relates to a number of different areas, whether it's mental health, um, uh, physicians, uh, dental, all those kinds of things. And I think uh, I have been having a lot of conversations with appropriations. I think they, there are some, perhaps some reservations there, given that schools have $400 million right now, uh, and people could try these pilots right now with some of those dollars. Uh, but I think they would certainly, um, my inclination also is that they would support uh, or at least take our opinion quite seriously if, if we were to advance this this year. Uh, but with that, we'll continue our, our, our path and see what, uh, where we land. So with that, um, Mr. Demaray, is there anything that I missed in that little overview pilot program? Uh, goes to, uh, I'm not sure how many schools could participate, but basically um, we're talking about schools being able to hire someone that again, can work and create these wraparound services. And also uh, these individuals, as I remember from some of the earlier testimony, they could start to develop ways to continue the work that they started. In other words, they can look for different funding opportunities, either within local government, state government, federal government, perhaps private funding, that sort of thing. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, the appropriations mentioned 3.4 million from extra three funds. Yep. Um, and you did ask for a couple of changes, um, which I've done for you uh, to work in some literacy language. Yes, I did indeed. Uh, I do have some literacy language that I would love to actually, if that's okay, do you mind if we put that on the table now uh, and see what, uh, senators are thinking. So I, I think for me, I, I'm just looking uh, if there are ways to tie literacy into even this kind of work, if it makes sense, uh, I would love to do so. But um, so Mr. Demery, do you want to uh, share some of those uh, ideas? Sure, of course. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've emailed us anything or if you want to just bring it up. It should be, a, I emailed it to Gene, I think. It might be on the website, I'm not sure, but I have it here. Um, right, if you don't mind bringing it up, I think that would be, that would be great. Okay. <clears throat> okay, uh, for the record, uh, Jim Damaray, Ledge Council, <clears throat> walking through draft 1.1 of your draft amendment to H106. Uh, it's a strike all. Uh, um, and the changes are in yellow, and there are only three areas of change here, all around uh, literacy. So the first change is in the findings. So we're adding, <coughs> adding a new finding that says, um, recognizing that literacy proficiency is a foundational learning skill uh, community schools can advance the state goal of improving literacy for all students in the state. Uh, achieving this goal will, will require a multi-year and multi-dimensional effort requiring uh, continued focus by the General Assembly, the administration, and school leaders. And, and community schools are in, an, an important component of that effort. So that's the finding. And then we go on to um, there are four pillars for community schools, just to remind the com committee. Um, so the definition is here, uh, sorry, uh, here, 
um, kinetic school program. And so the first pillar is integrated student support. The second is expanded and enriched learning time and opportunities. The third is active family community engagement. And the fourth is collaborative leadership and practices. So on the third one, we'd be adding, adding a, a shell. So um, in terms of the definition of active family and community engagement, which brings students, families, and the community into the school as partners in children's education. It makes the school a community hub uh, providing adults with a facility to address, to access, sorry, educational opportunities they want, which shall include access to evidence-based literacy instruction and may include a number, a number of other things that are unchanged. And lastly, the, the changes of our use of funding. So use of grant funding, um, what we see before was 1A, which is uh, to hire a community school coordinator, or if you have one, to um, further develop your plan. Uh, now we're adding a B. Uh, so uh, shall be used for to develop and implement a plan to improve literacy outcomes and objectively assess those outcomes. So those are the changes to work in literacy into the bill. So those are just some thoughts uh, we can <clears throat> hear from our, our witnesses, but it's just a, another uh, avenue perhaps. Some of that work will likely be getting done uh, through our other work, but um, it seemed like there might be some, some areas for uh, improving our work. Any questions or at this point? Comments, okay. Okay, Ms. Mayor, am I pronouncing that correctly? You are. Terrific. Uh, welcome to Senate Education. We know that you testified on House Education on this bill. Glad to have you here and uh, look forward to hearing from you. So the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you, Chair Campion, and thank you to the other members of the committee. Um, I did enjoy the conversation with the House Education Committee, and I'm happy to be back to talk with the members of the Senate Education Committee. Um, my name is Anna Mayer, and I'm a research and policy advisor at the Learning Policy Institute, uh, which is a nonprofit and nonpartisan education research and policy organization. And I'm based out in the Bay Area, so I'm enjoying seeing pictures of beautiful Vermont <laughs> in your virtual backgrounds. Um, I am here today because I have researched community schools extensively, which includes lead authorship of a 2017 review of the community schools evidence base. And I have entered that into the written record in the form of a research brief. Um, so I did share some written testimony with this committee as well. And I am delighted to see that findings from this evidence base are strongly reflected in H106. And I'll, I'll uh, talk more about that briefly today. Um, so I will share some information again about that evidence base. Um, I'll give an overview of the national landscape of state-funded community school initiatives uh, with an emphasis of what this strategy can look like in smaller and more rural settings. And I'll provide some examples of how community schools have responded effectively to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I'll try to keep my remarks brief. I'm happy to answer any questions as best I can. And, uh, oh, I did also want to just acknowledge that there are already great examples of community schools that are present in Vermont. And I'm, I'm happy to see um, Andrew Labarge on here today. I really enjoyed hearing about the Molly Stark School and the Winooski School-Based Health Centers uh, when I was testifying with the House Education Committee. And so my understanding is that Vermont is well positioned to support this work uh, because there's a strong tradition of schools functioning as centers of the community. So in terms of the community schools evidence base, um, as was just noted, the four pillars of community schooling are mentioned and defined in H106, and those are integrated student supports, expanded and enriched learning time, active family and community engagement, and collaborative leadership and practice. Uh, and I'll just share briefly a bit more information about each of these pillars in the associated evidence base, which does show that community schools can make a positive difference for students' educational outcomes. So first, the research team 
uh, with the Learning Policy Institute and the National Education Policy Center, identified the four pillars by reviewing a core set of studies that were examining places that were calling themselves community schools. And we were analyzing the common features of these schools across a set of studies. And what we found is uh, that the first pillar, integrated student supports, sometimes known as wraparound services, uh, includes supports like dental care, counseling, physical health care, housing access, transportation and food assistance, often facilitated by a full-time coordinator who can manage partnerships and connect students and families to services. And I do think that's a really important point. That's obviously a focus of the bill. And just to note that there is a lot of federal funding incoming to schools. Uh, there is a flood of resources. The coordination is a really, really important part of that um, because as we all know, educators are, work very hard and have a lot of responsibilities. So having someone at a school who can really dedicate their time and focus on bringing the school community together and making sure that resources are accessible to students and, and families and well-coordinated uh, can make a really big difference to implementation. The second pillar is expanded and enriched learning time and opportunities. Uh, which includes things like academic support, enrichment, and real-world learning opportunities, things like work-based learning, internships, and project-based learning. And these can take place after school, over the weekend, and during the summer. So with the discussion I just heard around incorporating literacy, that's actually where I would see literacy most strongly reflected is in the expanded and enriched learning time and opportunities pillar, because that really is about expanding and enriching the curriculum as well as extending the school day and the school year. Ms. Mayor, if I could just interrupt. Mm -hmm. One reason I was afraid to put it there, but I'm happy to for you to correct me on this, is I was afraid that, you know, I, I really want to make sure it's all happening also in schools uh, during the day, and I didn't want people to think, oh, they'll get it later. You know what I'm saying? Later in the day. And, uh, yeah. Does that make sense? It does, and I'm glad you're bringing that up because I do think that when we talk about the expanded uh, learning time pillar that the mo we, we often think of after school programming and perhaps summer programming. Yes. The reason why our team has defined this as expanded and enriched learning time is that we're also talking about the curriculum during the day as well. Okay. And so a really well-functioning community school is going to have community a, a community-based approach to learning. Uh, which is, is, is unified during the school day as well as during extended learning time. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any other questions about that now, or I can keep going with more remarks. And I <laughs> yeah, have questions right now, so uh, why don't you continue? Okay. Uh, so those are the first two pillars, integrated student supports, expanded and enriched learning time, and opportunities. Um, so really what opportunities students and families have during the school day and during extended learning hours. The third is active family and community engagement, which you know is certainly about engaging um, parents and family members. Um, really inviting them not just to volunteer or um, partake in services at the school, which is important, but also to serve as true partners in supporting and educating students. And that leads directly into the fourth pillar, which is collaborative leadership and practices, which is really about establishing a culture of professional learning, collective trust, and shared responsibility for outcomes. And strategies that can support this pillar include having a site-based leadership team, employing a community school coordinator, which is certainly reflected in the bill, and supporting teacher learning communities. So it's it really a piece of this is about what governance structures and positions you can put in, in place to facilitate collaborative leadership and decision making. So those are the four pillars. And again, those came from the research review that we did. And uh, after identifying those four pillars, our research team reviewed over 140 studies of both community school initiatives and uh, you know, looking at studies affiliated with each of those pillars. And we found that there's no one size fits all approach to implementing the pillars. So each school and community is unique in terms of its assets and needs, and therefore each community school will look a bit different. So the programs and services may vary somewhat uh, across schools and across communities. And with those pillars in place that you still can have a consistent community school strategy, but the details of the particular programs and services may not be identical across sites. 
Uh, and overall, we found benefits associated with a wide range of community school models. Um, this research, again, is, is uh, cited in my written testimony. Uh, we saw improvements in everything from test scores and grades, especially in mathematics uh, and high school graduation rates to students' attitudes towards school. And we also found some evidence that community schools can help to close achievement gaps for low-income students, English learners, and students in special education. And I cited those studies specifically in my written testimony. Um, of course, program effectiveness is related to the intensity and quality of services that students and families receive, as well as the length of time the strategy has been in place. So in this sense, implementation matters greatly for achieving positive results. And I'm just gonna share a few thoughts on what those elements of high quality implementation can look like. One key element is having a community school coordinator or manager, as I said previously, uh, who can increase the capacity of school staff to work in partnership with students, families, and local community members. Um, but it's really important to understand this coordinator does not work in isolation. So another key element of effective implementation is establishing a site-based leadership team that has a broad range of stakeholders from the school and community, uh, which may include students, depending on age appropriateness, uh, families, community leaders, teachers, administrative staff, and members of partner organizations. And it's really together that the coordinator and that that collaborative leadership team can work on a third element of effective implementation, which is conducting an assets and needs assessment. And the purpose of that is to identify resources that are already present in the school and the surrounding community, um, and as well as the needs the school community has that can be addressed through existing and new community partnerships. And I'll just say that having worked uh, with community school initiatives in different parts of the country, it can be amazing to see that, you know, sometimes even knowing what services are already in place or which students are receiving those services is not always a given. So there is an element of making sure that the existing resources are being used effectively and efficiently. And then also having a community conversation about, you know, what are, what are the needs within our community and, you know, what are the resources or partnerships we may want to establish to address those those needs. So just a thought around, you know, the plan to assess literacy outcomes, one way to think about that might be that actually a broader needs and assets assessment could include an element of looking at literacy within a community, how students are doing, what supports are in place, and what, su what additional supports might, might be needed. Um, but I think this, this is about making sure both that the community has a voice in decision making and also that um, that the existing resources are uh, being used well and that new resources are really hitting the mark in terms of what, what the needs are. Um, and then I'll just say briefly in terms of the national landscape uh, that many states, uh, both large and small, are investing in community schools. And um, my written testimony has some more detailed examples, but uh, New York provides funding for community schools in high need districts through its school funding formula. Um, and in addition, the state funds three regional technical assistance centers for community schools uh, that work with both small and large schools and districts. And those TA centers are working with uh, in more rural areas of, of the state. So they've worked on community schools in Rome, New York, that has a population of 34,000, and Messina, which has a population of 13,000. So it's not just New York City that has community schools. Uh, another example comes from New Mexico, which has funded $50,000 uh, one-year planning grants and $150,000 annual implementation grants that are on a three-year cycle, similar to H106. Uh, total funding was $3.3 million in 2020, so very similar to what this committee is considering. The grants go to schools and districts of different sizes, uh, including Cuba Independent School District, which has 550 students in K-12 and is in rural northern New Mexico. And Cuba is using this funding to offer expanded learning programs focused on Navajo culture and partnership with local tribal leaders, as well as integrated student supports. And finally, uh, West Virginia passed a state board of education resolution in support of community schools and has provided technical assistance through the state education agency. This includes the Reconnecting McDowell Initiative in McDowell County, uh, which is an innovative public private partnership in an area hit hard by the declining coal industry and the opioid pandemic. 
Uh, it brings together government agencies, local business, teacher union, and nonprofit organizations to offer enrichment programs, integrated student supports, and economic development activities in the local community. So we're really seeing this, this work is happening in different parts of the country in different contexts. And the last thing I wanted to hit on is just COVID-19 response. Uh, evidence is also emerging that community schools are well positioned to respond to the pandemic. These schools have strong relationships with students and families. They have a coordinated infrastructure in place, and they have partnerships with community-based organizations and government agencies that allow them to quickly and effectively respond to student and family needs. So one example is that there's, there was a community school coordinator at Doña Ana Elementary School in New Mexico who staffed a help desk to field calls from parents and was able to connect families to mental health and social support services over the past year. Um, Oakland Unified is a full service community school district out in California. They kept three school based health centers open during uh, the recent shelter in place that we had, which uh, so that they were able to provide urgent in person care and also virtual care. And, um, you know, kind of touching on what this can look like during the school day teachers at the UCLA community schools in Los Angeles adapted their curriculum uh, to guide students through relevant project based learning. So for example, they had students who were looking at it who did a 10 week inquiry unit on the way that um, COVID-19 was impacting uh, communities of color disparately. And so the teachers were, are really part of that community school and they're thinking of their curriculum in the context of their community as well. Uh, so taken together, I think these examples can show how community schools are well positioned to adapt their approach and effectively support students and families in times of crisis. So I thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Committee, questions, center lines. So uh, these, all these programs uh, look absolutely uh, amazing <laughs> to say the least. And are these all pilot programs or any of them now in, uh, in place uh, in perpetuity, so to speak? Have they become part of the school culture and the, it, will the school continue with the programs that are currently in place? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, well, so first of all, the New York example that I cited, that is part of this, the state funding formula and Maryland has also put community schools into the state funding formula. So that is ongoing funding. I think what we're seeing with some of the, I mean, some of the grant programs, like the New Mexico grant programs newer, so I can't make a claim as to what we're going to see. Um, but what we often see with grant funding is that over time, you know, part of what a coordinator does is that they establish new partnerships and that allows for the blending and braiding of different funding sources. School-based health centers are often able to bill Medicaid, or sorry, Medi-Cal is in California, Medicaid. Um, so they're able to, to bill, you know, federal health dollars um, after school funding sources from federal and state can be very helpful in supporting this work. There also is research on um, Albuquerque community schools that, showing, that shows the return on, on investment for having a coordinator at a school is $7 in benefits for, for every dollar invested. So, there's, so there is some evidence that you start to see a cost benefit savings um, from this approach, which then often does incentivize um, schools and districts to, to continue funding those positions. And I think it is, the, the coordinator is, is key to this work, but of course, as I've said, it's, they don't work in isolation, but to have stable funding for that position is, is important. Um, and people find a way to make it work through different funding sources. Um, and the other thing I would just say is that there's a number of districts throughout the country, uh, including New York City, um, Baltimore, Chicago, uh, Los Angeles, Oakland, uh, these are obviously all larger urban districts, but they have had longstanding uh, initiatives in place. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I, I very much like the idea of, you know, whatever schools were to, if we were to move in this direction, and I think our appropriations would probably, you know, as we're sort of <clears throat> figuring things out and making an argument to them, you know, if we couldn't in some ways identify uh, or make sure that the schools that need this the most get these dollars. And right now, I think the only criterion uh, in there is uh, free and reduced lunch at 40%. Is that accurate, Jim? Uh, 
apologies, Senator Bruce, uh, Senator <laughs> Campion, I was working on something else. You did that, please? No problem. I think uh, this, we're just talking about the, 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 the only thing that would really, you know, in terms of identifying, if I'm interested in making certain, and the committee's interested in these dollars going to the neediest uh, schools. In other words, the ones that are, do lack, you know, the mental health services, the dental health care. The only thing that this is really saying in terms of qualifications is, you know, you have to at least have 40% of your students receiving free and reduced lunch to sort of get you into the application pool. Is that true? Correct. That's correct. Or you, if you need uh, state support, if you're on a, um, there's two criteria. Uh, the other one is around, find it here. Um, yeah, or we have to identify for comprehensive, comprehensive um, equity support. I'm looking to Senator Lyons a little bit now on this. Senator Lyons, one of the things I know health and welfare has worked on for a long time, and I know we've heard about it in this committee, and that's dealing with trauma, dealing with, you know, helping kids who, again, you know, in schools, and we've heard it, you know, don't have those supports. And I'm wondering if you feel from where you're sitting, and, and also I look to health and welfare, and everybody on this, but Senator Lyons has been working on this for a long time. Do we have enough in this that really makes certain that the dollars are going to those schools that really, really are going to need it the most, if that makes sense? Well, that's a very good question. And actually, while I was reading the bill, I started thinking about that exact okay. question. So I would, I would think we'd have, we can go through the bill again and then sure. uh, identify some places perhaps for improvement, but okay. um, yes. And I think you saw the article I sent out sometime last week about yes. the, uh, uh, the economy as being, or poverty being so important uh, as a social determinant for lack Absolutely. of success. Yeah. yeah. And I just, I'm just looking to make sure, like our other work, that it's, it's, it's strategic, it's targeted, that it's going where it, it's most needed so that in, in three years, if we had 30 schools that needed all of this wraparound services the most, that we would also be working to continue this work. In, in other words, as Ms. Meyer, Mayer saying, you know, three years, and then how do we get them to continue, uh, I think is, is really important. Uh, other questions or comments at this point? Okay, uh, Ms. Meyer, I don't know if you're able to stay with us or if uh, you need to, to leave. I know it's only one o'clock there. Uh, yes, I'm happy to, to hang on. Um, that works I can you. also, if it would be helpful, I can share some information. California also funded a grant program using ESSER funding, a competitive community school grant program in fiscal year 2020-21. And we, we did structure things in a way, we just speaking as a Californian, mm -hmm. um, you know, things were structured in a way that uh, did look at COVID related disparities is one of the competitive criteria. So I'm happy to, sh to follow up by email and share that um, for consideration if that's helpful. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind sharing that with uh, our committee assistant, uh, Ms. Lowell, and then she can share it with, with the committee. That would be great. So we have that. Well, thanks for sticking around with us. Uh, Mr. Labarge, how are you? I'm great. Thank thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, we I really enjoyed the, the commentary today, uh, and, and especially in between meetings. It was really quite quite enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it's great to have you with us. Uh, really appreciate it. You work at a school that really was a pioneer in this area. Uh, uh, for centers that aren't aware, uh, Molly Stark School started looking at wraparound services with a grant that I believe he was then Congressman Bernie Sanders and Sue McGuire, who was a well-known principal and educational leader in this area and in the state. And that was some time ago and uh, really created a wraparound service model that um, has has worked. And I, and I know it's not what it once was. Um, and I'm just wondering if you wouldn't mind taking us through your experience. I don't know how long you've been at Molly Stark now. Uh, this is my seventh year teaching at Molly Stark, although I had a couple of years uh, where I taught. Uh, so 
counted eight years. There was a, a big gap where I actually left the state, taught in my home state of New York, and then came back to teach in Bennington again. So, um, so eight years. But uh, my my history of Molly Stark goes back to the 15 years ago, right at the end of the the model. And I'll I'll just tell you a little bit of, about it. Um, <laughs> Great. So let me introduce myself. I'm Angela Barge. I'm I'm third grade teacher at Molly Stark. Um, this is my 17th year teaching. I like I said I I started teaching when my kids were young, and I went back to school, got a degree. Um, my degree is through Goddard University in Vermont, so my first license was Vermont, and uh, that's where I started my teaching career. Um, so I am uh, planning on retiring at Molly Stark. Uh, it is a great place to be and um, just a really great school. Let me uh, give you a little details. We, we have about 350. Uh, we've had as much as 400 uh, learners enrolled at, at a one time. We're K to five. Um, the district has a middle school that houses uh, six, seventh, and eighth graders, but uh, some of the elementary schools only feed their seventh and eighth graders. So we're one of them that where they, they leave us when they're sixth graders. Um, but Mont, for a long time, the, the school districts went through sixth grade. So um, that was kind of during that model. Um, Molly had, uh, again, Sue, Sue McGuire kind of initiated this, but there was also a really great assistant principal who's we retired with 47 years in the district, um, just a, a, a wonderful person and a, and a really big miss. But her role in, in kind of creating this community school and what she did, um, you know, you would drive by the school on the weekend, she'd be parked out front. You know, she was working all weekend. Um, and, and things like uh, it was just amazing. She knew every family. She knew um, what what needs they had. Um, she would be calling on the phone and, and supported if there was a reason. Uh, and it was just really kind of became, it's definitely more than a one person show, but it was something that she initiated. And as the assistant principal role as well, it kind of is really a difficult thing to, to, to handle. So um, that's why it is so important to have somebody to coordinate all these things. Now, in our building, we have uh, an audiologist, one of the a, a pretty good facility because I know I've had a learner in the past who went all the way to Dartmouth for a hearing um, appointment and they said, you know, you should go see Dr. Lloyd Scott. She's in Bennington. It turns out she was just three doors down in the hallway from our classroom. So uh, having those services in the building are huge. Um, they also, um, before COVID, the community members, elderly, could come into the facility during the school day and, and attend uh, the facility. But um, so we mentioned those wraparound services. This meant that if there was an issue uh, with a learner and possibility, maybe a hearing disability, we could have that analyzed and, and taken care of right inside our building. They, they wouldn't have to go to a referral or outside the school, take a day off of school, et cetera. So that was huge. Um, another really big part of, of those days was our dental facility. Um, our, we had uh, a great dentist in the area who would spend a, a one full day in the building and uh, kids would come to see him during the school day. He'd come to my knock on my door. I need so and so, and and out he would go and down the hallway to the to the dentist. So um, again, you know, that's a huge benefit for parents to have those kind of services right in the school itself. Um, and Mr. Labarge, I just want to interrupt for a second. So when Dr. Brady and others were doing these, were these services had they been coordinated in a way so that, that they were free, or was it just that they were coordinated and then families would would be billed? Yeah, so I'm I'm looking back at some of the old um, the the old website, which was kind of the, about the Molly Stark Family Center, um, and it was primarily based on uh, Medicare. So if if they were um, they didn't have a dentist or they were uh, qualified for Medicare, they were eligible. Um, but the services also kind of extended as his his um, dental hygienist would actually offer uh, classroom visits teach about cleaning their teeth and all those things that you would get from a hygienist. Um, and uh, so not just the, the kids that were uh, high needs, but everybody was able to experience it a little bit. So, um, but you're right. That is something that um, I'm not sure if they could do it for every learner in the school, in the school, my size, if, you know, to, to incorporate uh, visits, you know, cleanings and things like that for every kid. Uh, but it was something that's definitely uh, again about need, right? It's really about need. So, uh, families that can't do it on their own could could get that in the school. Um, 
The thinking on the pillars uh, that's really important is is the uh, the extended school day, um, and we have had uh, an early ed program housed in our building that um, three and four year olds can attend. And that also uh, incorporates a morning uh, drop off and an afternoon, um, you know, after school care. So that parents could could drop the children off at seven. Then they go from the early ed center to their classroom when the school day starts. And then they can go back to the after school area after school. Um, we also offered after school for all learners, even the ones that weren't in the after school or after after hours program, I guess is, is how it would. And, and that usually went from three to four, um, 3.30, about when they start till 4.30. So they actually would get about an hour and a half. They would eat, eat a snack and lunch from three to 3.30, organize. And then we had um, teachers and community members. We had some college kids come in and offer after school programs. Um, and, you know, everything from movie making to uh, I, I offered a chess club and, you know, really great things that, that the kids just they really would just rather be at school. And um, in a lot of the cases, you know, leaving the school is causes them quite a lot of anxiety and, and you know, who's going to be home and if there's going to be food um, and those. So the longer we can keep them in the school, I think that that's really helpful and beneficial. Um, I actually taught in a charter school for a few years, so I, I, um, our school day started at 7.15 and went till 4.15. That was our regular school day, and that was actually because the, the, the uh, public schools would bus in and out different times, so they had to bus, bus them in before and then bring them home after. So it gave the, the parents about two and a half hours extra um, where the kids were in school. But So the extended learning time is really important, and that certainly would help uh, literacy, you know, having – the access to uh, books and library uh, and programs, uh, you know, both after school and, and before school really help. But um, during the day, obviously, um, you know, we, we, we high quality instruction. We, we've done so many things where we've been kind of identified for a long time as a school that, uh, you know, isn't meeting all the, uh, the academic standards. But it's a, it's, it has, has a lot to do with, you know, having the services for all the other things. So um, we also have two school um, guidance counselors in the building that are, you know, employed by the school district. And then we have a, a, a counselor that comes in from UCS that, again, for our uh, kids that are un, um, identified or have uh, serious traumas, um, things like that, they can vi take the, those learners during the school day and, and uh, talk to them and help with the things that are going on in their lives. So that's really important. Let me see if I covered them. Um, um, oh, and another great thing that was really cool and hasn't happened since COVID, I really miss it, actually happened right outside my classroom. So it was a little distracting, but every Wednesday, uh, twice a month um, at 7 a.m., the, the food truck would pull up to the parking lot and the families from the area um, which I kind of forgot to, you know, there's three or four housing developments within a mile of the school. So uh, a great deal of families would come wait in line and get food, um, you know, produce, eggs, uh, butter, things like that. So uh, really great. And it was called the Veggie Van Gogh. So, um, again, something that would have to be coordinated with. And, and it takes a lot of time to do that. So um, you met, we, we, we had a um, what we called a... Um, Sorry, I, I was talking with Colin about it. A school leadership group, but it incorporated the, uh, the, the community members, um, some teachers, some administrators, um, and, and they would call it the shared decision-making team. So they would uh, talk about things like, you know, how can we put um, literacy nights in here and, and fund those things? And um, so and the members of the parent-teacher group were in there. That was a really good couple of years of, in the last few years. That's changed. Uh, we've had a little different leadership change as well. Um, so things kind of, you know, as you go from one principal to another, again, I think th things have changed. The needs are still there. Uh, obviously, it's worse than it's been, you know, in years. Um, I, I hear stories every day, and I just, you know, I, so it's hard sometimes to, like, hear what's going on in their lives and, and try to, hold back tears, but, um, the, these guys, they, they need to have services available to them. And I, and it's, and it's just that, uh, so many families just don't have these things. So the more we can offer in the school, 
the better. I hope I'm touching on the, the things I, I yeah, honestly exactly. wasn't as prepared for this as I was for the house. No, and I uh, appreciate you're, you're, you guys. Yes, no, you're doing a, you're doing a great job. And this is, this is very helpful. It's giving, I think, everybody a sense of, you know, some of the real opportunities here, even more than I think, at least speaking for myself, than I was thinking about, you know, in terms of engaging not only medical, mental health professionals, et cetera, but uh, people that might come in and give a talk or a college student comes in and does, you know, a conversation or, or work on literacy, not all those kinds of coordinating, all those possibilities, I think, are are huge. Uh, food, without a doubt, the, the Veggie Van Gogh uh, uh, van. Um, I mean, I think what I'm, the only area that I keep kind of returning to and want to just make sure that we hit is what I mentioned to Senator Lyons is, uh, you know, I would just love to make sure that we're getting those schools and those children that just need it the most. And uh, a couple of worries right now for me, uh, or one is that we're asking people to apply, just knowing again, people have so much money right now that are coming into the schools. And I just wanna make certain again, that AOE is involved in a way that says, listen, we know you're crazy busy. We all, you know, we're recovering from COVID on so many different fronts. We know you have a lot of money, but we also want to help you set this up uh, and identify those schools and, and work with them. Senator Lyons. Yes, you know, thank you, uh, Mr. Labarge. That was terrific. And uh, as you were as you were talking, I'm thinking about the years that you've been in education, the changes that have happened, and the understanding about a trauma informed environment uh, and what we consider to be adverse childhood experiences, but it sounds like the culture you've developed is a culture of support that helps to move kids away from trauma. So that, you know, it's just terrific what, what you've been doing. And, and actually my question is both for um, Ms. Meyer as well as for Mr. Labarge. And that is, as I'm reading your testimony, uh, Ms. Meyer, you're talking about, or I don't know if that's the proper, um, uh, way to address your name, but uh, that's totally fine. <laughs> that, that's good. Okay, so I thinking you said that different models would uh, be accepted as your as folks are looking at these community schools, and the for me it would be fascinating to look at some recognition of a trauma-informed environment and currently our schools are developing our PBI and whether or not that type of assessment or inclusion in, uh, in the application process would, could be made. Uh, certainly as the other things as you're talking both of you. So I'm, I've asked a question. <laughs> asked that question, but uh, but as you're talking, um, you're identifying kids who have significant, terrible problems, and we know the child of a, a single parent is more at risk than others, and we know that children in certain areas of poverty are at risk greater than others. All of those things. But do you directly uh, intervene? since you've got family members participating in these programs, that's one of the four factors that you've listed, is, do you have a system of intervention to, um, to help move these children away from the trauma they experience or at least to become more resilient to it? So big question mm. yeah. for both of you. And I, you know, seriously, it would be helpful to hear if there are schools out there doing this or if Mr. Labarge, if you have that at your institution. Senator Lyons, thanks for that question. Um, and uh, Ms. Meyer, I just wanted to touch this because it is really something that our district has really pushed really hard to inform um, us that, you know, to be in a, a trauma-informed school isn't just to say you're trauma-informed, it's to really understand what trauma is. Uh, we've had the privilege of having Dave Melnick come down and, and offer a number of professional learning opportunities. I, I took a couple of his classes that were uh, through Castleton. Um, and it really changed how I, how I teach and how I approach, like, uh, you know, 
behaviors because when I when I have a learner who comes in um, and he's crawling under the chair and you know I'm trying to teach him how to uh, understand vowel consonant consonant vowel break and realizing he's not getting my instruction and the other kids are actually getting distracted but but when we sit down and talk I realize that his brother was punching him all night and they they didn't sleep because they didn't have anything to eat and all these things went on in his life so we, we build relationships, we, uh, and then we, we help them, you know, um, the, Dave talks about um, having them be able to, uh, sorry, to, you kind of, you have to get them off the ledge before you can actually help them to, to recover. So, so there's no way that, like, um, consequences uh, will work in a case where a learner's in a, in a, in a case of, um, where he's not in in the state of mind that it will be able to function. So, so we help them with that. We've got great, um, you know, teacher support. So if I have uh, a learner, I, I, you know, he needs some. He needs to go and have a walk and, and talk with somebody. That that there's someone available. You know, having having those um, counselors in the building, and even myself. I, I'm sorry. I, I had a learner just the other day. I could see that the uh, para educator was struggling with him. He was in the hallway. She was asked to kind of, kind of take him out for a walk a little while and see what's going on. And he was climbing on on the the paper uh, pallet. And so I had known him from summer school. We had a little conversation. We started talking. He says, "Well, his his you know his stepfather's sick or his father is sick. He hadn't seen him in ten years, um, or since you know forever, right? And now um, his stepfather. So he had this conversation as we walked back to his classroom. And that, you know when he went in the classroom, he was smiling again. So he they need to have the, the support in their lives. Um, and, and so teachers have to be trained to do that. And it's really, really hard and work. Th thank you for that, because it, what's refreshing to hear is how it sounds very natural to you and for the teachers in your school to be doing that, where we hear from many schools that that's not my job. We need to hire counselors to do that work. So this is refreshing and I'm wondering if this is consistent with other community schools and and then maybe you could comment uh Miss Meyer about that about yeah happy to all of this please <laughs> yes I do see it as really consistent it's something we've seen with a lot of community school initiatives is that they are um also focused on implementing multi-tiered systems of supports and or PDIS and uh, as well as at the school level, oftentimes coordination of services teams are, are part of the work that a community school coordinator may be leading. And so I, I think um, it is very much about increasing the capacity and really having someone at the school site who can really think systemically about what systems and processes can you put into place to really support amazing teachers like Mr. Labarge who are you know, going out of their way to really take a trauma-informed approach. Um, the other thing I would add too is that one of the potentials with a state grant program is, is the potential to create a learning community among the different grantees and also to provide some technical assistance and support around best practices. So I think you can go farther with a high quality implementation with a network um, than if each person is trying to reinvent the wheel on their own. Um, and so that, you know, like, I think I heard you say, Mr. Labarge, that there was some training around how to take a trauma informed approach to instruction. And so there's a potential to provide that training to grantees and, and also for the coordinators to, you know, to train, train the trainer models too. That's a, what we see a lot with a lot of technical assistance is working with a network of coordinators who can then bring that learning back to their school community. I would certainly, I think center lines and, you know, you, touched on something that I would love to kind of pursue. I'm not sure who, yeah, that would be great. And I'm wondering <laughs> in our lines, if you might even think about who we might bring in to continue this conversation about trauma, because I think tying that into this would be, would be great as we continue to sort of work with AOE to see if they can target schools. And then again, how can we, we, we get at the trauma issue? Yeah, I'm. I'm happy to work with you to do that. Uh, That'd be great. And I've been right. I I just wrote down a couple of uh, organizations that um, the state has worked with in the past uh, for special ed or other areas, and think that they may be able to provide insight uh, into the bill that we're working on. 
And is there I, I, Mr. Labarge also had a suggestion too. So did you have a suggestion, Mr. Labarge? You're muted, Andrew. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure what my suggestion was. I, uh, Mr. I, uh, I think you talked about someone by the name of Milken who uh, came down to work. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, um, from the um, up in Burlington, the Institute. Yeah. And um, are, you talking about, district... are, are, are you talking about NFI or? NFI, yeah. That's who exactly who I was writing down when yeah, you were Dave talking. Malnick. Yeah, Dave and, and NFI, just so I know, so we can uh, have Jeannie reach out to them. Uh, that uh, stands for? Okay, uh, don't ask Northeast me Northeast Family yeah. Institute, I think. That sounds and, good. And it's yeah. Dave. <laughs> Dave Melnick. I know that name, Ginny. Sure. Yep, and, there, and there's another um, another uh, person who works there of, who I've I've gone to visit with many times and talk with about this. So we'll, yeah. we'll get okay. somebody, yeah. Somebody well, this, this feels like we're, um, we're getting, we're getting, it sounds like people are, are, are excited and that we can maybe continue to work on this, you know, tomorrow where we would, again, hear from perhaps Mr. Melnick and a couple of other people, uh, work a little bit with AOE to, to sort of help them make sure that they're identifying the schools that are going to need it the most. Um, I would love to, to add some literacy language and also just, again, beef up the criteria around who would be best to qualify for this. And I hate to see the school actually end up applying just because a lot of the schools that we're looking to have to do this work, they just don't have the time and energy to do this work, you know, to, to apply, to set, put together applications. And we've heard this, we even heard this with literacy, you know, people, you know, they're, they're doing the work that Mr. Labarge is doing and others are doing. And, you know, to ask them to put together applications for things, I think it it's, there has to be, a, I think, a happy medium in there so that people can get what they need without taking away from, you know, other duties and responsibilities, if that makes sense. And I don't want to throw a wrench in things, but I do want to reiterate that the yeah. New Mexico grant program that I mentioned does have planning grants as well as implementation grants. So that is one approach that other states have taken to kind of recognize that people you know, schools may be at different places in their journey and they need different things. Um, you know, I think one advantage of a planning grant is that it can be a lighter lift in terms of an application process. And then, you know, it's a smaller amount of funding, but it's a year yep. to really do some of the planning um, together with support. Is that, uh, does the name, Mr. Goldberg, does that ring a bell with connected to the Mexico planning grants? No, okay. Greenberg? Is it Greenberg? <laughs> I do know uh, Mr. Dave Greenberg in New Mexico. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, it may be he that I think uh, someone from the NEA recommended that we perhaps uh, reach out to. Yeah, he's been a local community schools leader in New Mexico and is now supporting the implementation of the state grant program. And I think he would have a great perspective to share with this community. Chuck Myers is my connection at um, NFI. Okay. Yeah. And um, right. Yeah. Great. I'm, I'm going to touch that. one more about that. Um, what Dave did actually was yeah. um, the district initiative was to train a group of teachers and administrators, and then we were to be the trainers. Of course, we didn't know that going in, but mm -hmm. that was kind of the initiative was we, we want to use you guys and then and then we brought it to our schools like so right. um and it, it was it was quite challenging like like uh she was talking about uh having time to do things like where do i find the time to plan that to do that you know with our our schedule a little bit different now this year with uh we I have all my kids back now which is really exciting but uh on wednesdays we still are asynchronous so they 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 do a number of things we have all our meetings and all our planning is done on wednesdays so um, but, um, yeah, without those days, I don't, I don't know how, how we would find the time to do the things that, that we're, we're talking. So it really okay. does require a lot of extra time to, to plan and coordinate these things. So thanks. I think we're, I think, uh, very helpful. I think we're going to leave it there, uh, unless Senator Hooker, do you have a final point or question? I, I, thank you. I was just curious to know if you still have a coordinator and, and a site team that works at your school or, or has that kind of morphed into something else, Sandra? 
like I said, I, um, after the retirement, um, that, that really wasn't a position. It was just something she kind of did. Um, so I think a lot of the things, and then COVID hit. So she, she left us a year before. We had a half a year into that school year, and COVID hit. Um, but we still have, uh, um, like, so we, we have different people. I, I coordinate the summer program. We had an after-school coordinator. Um, you know, we have a, a school liaison who can who contacts families and things like that. But it really, it's just kind of like, it's not pieced together. And that's what that person might really be able to do. Say, I need so-and-so to do this and so-and-so to do this. And that's really where that position, but no, we don't really have anybody anymore. So. No, that's helpful to know. And, and maybe it, it sounds like you all could also qualify for, for this kind of perhaps work going forward. Um, so it might work for you. Uh, okay. I, we do, we've uh, been at this for a while. I think we're in a good spot where, uh, I have some direction. I'll work with Jeannie after this to, uh, have additional, uh, witnesses in tomorrow to continue along this conversation with, um, on trauma and wraparound schools. Thank you, uh, Center Alliance for, uh, those ideas. We'll reach out to those individuals, uh, please. One other comment. We yeah, do please. have a trauma-informed director in uh, AHS secretary's office. And and, uh, hey, this is the problem. Uh, Auburn Wa Wa Watersong left, and so I always forget who the new one is, but I'll try. That's right. I'll have Jeannie. Uh, yeah, that, that. that might be a good, a good person to link with, even though it's AHS. Sure. No, I think it's a great yeah. idea. Absolutely. All right. Senators, any final question? We'll return tomorrow to both uh, 106 and 426, and we'll vote on 1S100. And then uh, that's it. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Labarge, Ms. Mayor. Uh, terrific. Uh, really appreciate your work and appreciate uh, committee, uh, everybody's work this afternoon. Have a good day. Good evening. Thank you. Bye.